I'll now hand over to Cécile Lefebvre, who's going to talk about surveys. Firstly, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about surveys. Surveys are a vital area of INED's work, as we've seen, and which help make our institute what it is. Surveys span a whole range of activities at INED, from design through detailed preparation of implementation on the ground to documentation, dissemination and archiving. But before I start, I would like to pay homage to two people who recently passed away too soon, who made a huge contribution to surveys at INED and who also meant a lot to me personally, Pascal Ardouin and Martine Quaglia. So I would just like to remember them before I begin. I'll start with a brief, albeit too brief, historical and institutional overview of surveys at INED. I'll follow with some numbers, because as we've seen, we need numbers, and I'll conclude with some general remarks. The production of surveys has been an integral part of INED's work since the Institute was founded in 1945, and even before then. The website says that surveys developed at INED in the 1950s, but I just want to correct that slightly to 1945. And if you count all the surveys archived at INED, they go back to 1942. The wartime surveys were subsequently incorporated into the archives. Some 30 surveys were conducted in the 1940s. Some were very small scale, but as Catherine Bonvalet said earlier, three themes emerge that reveal a need to take stock after the war. There are surveys on the intellectual development of children, many surveys about families' living standards, especially housing and opinion polls. Those were the main issues covered in surveys in the 1940s. Surveys had a place in INED's organizational structure from 1945, first within the Department of of social psychology, initially headed by Jean Stutzel, who founded IFOP in 1938. He was soon succeeded by Alain Girard. Numerous surveys were conducted over the next few decades on women's work, on the ideal number of children, on the state of the population, on cohorts of school children, on immigration, or the famous survey on choice of spouse, to name but a few. In 1979, the department was renamed Department of Social Demography under Henri Leridan, who headed it until 1982. Mr. Leridan oversaw the creation of a surveys unit within the department, which was led by Benoit Riandet, who came to INED from Credoc. Mr. Riandet stayed in that position until 1993. The rest you know. In 1982, the surveys unit became the surveys service, an entity in its own right. The next key date was 1992-1993, when INED's director, Jacques Magou, decided to centralize all of the survey activities there. In other words, although the survey's service already existed, it wasn't until 1992-1993 that it incorporated everyone who had been working on surveys in different units. These are the names of the heads of the service. I will stop on the history there because the importance of surveys at INED obviously goes well beyond their place in the organizational structure. Nevertheless, I do think that having a single centralized service has contributed enormously to the visibility and continuity of the surveys at INED. By bringing methodological innovation and cumulative experience together, because this is what makes our system so special and valuable. Now for a few numbers. 
To illustrate the numbers, I hope it's legible, I used the Nestar catalogue of survey references, which is managed by the survey's service. Nestar might look rather dry, but it is a mine of information if you click on any of the metadata options. There are at least 230 surveys referenced at INED, and those are the only quantitative surveys. INED also has many qualitative surveys, but these need to be analyzed separately. So, INED has a high and fairly regular output of quantitative surveys. If you look at the list of surveys and the dates, you can see that three or four new surveys are added per year. Almost all of the surveys are documented. Although the data file is missing for many of the surveys, that's the difference between the two columns, we do have valuable metadata. The available data files covering about 50 surveys or one-fifth of the total are widely accessible to the research community. That percentage will increase as the most recent surveys are made available. Those 230 references cover a wide variety of surveys. If we take a closer look, we are struck by the diversity of themes methods, populations, potential for generalization, and relationship to social demand and current issues. To simplify, the surveys can be divided into three main types. Firstly, there are very local, high, specific surveys. I didn't find any funny titles, but I did find this rather poetic one, Death of the Hundred-Year Elms of Lauragais, a survey by Philippe Colomb from 1977. Genetic surveys are also highly specific. One example from 1989 is a survey on multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. That gives you an idea of the breadth of subjects covered in the surveys. Secondly, in addition to those highly specific surveys, there are exploratory surveys of small and medium-sized samples. An example of this type is a survey of young homeless people in Paris. Exploratory surveys are intended as models, prototypes, or a basis for further research. Last but not least, the remainder are the major surveys that have marked the history of INED. There's the famous choice of spouse survey, the geographical mobility and social integration survey from the short video, the context of sexuality in France, the transition to adulthood, as well as the historical demographic surveys and surveys that will make history like the GGS or ELF, and so many more that unfortunately I don't have time to name here. The vast majority of these surveys are about France, but INED researchers are also involved in surveys in other countries, especially in Africa. There's the demographic surveillance system in Senegal, the surveys on fuel wood in Mali, and the MAF survey on migration between Africa and Europe. Another way in which the surveys are highly diverse is the variable extent of INED's involvement. Some surveys are managed by INED from A to Z, funding, design and data collection. Other surveys are subcontracted, while increasingly others are partnerships, of which there are also various kinds. Furthermore, some surveys are not included in these 230 references, such as the Family History Survey from 1999 and the Coquelicot Survey on drug users. These are surveys in which INED was strongly involved, but was not responsible responsible for the documentation, which is why they are not in the reference catalogue, so the number of references should actually be higher. It's hard to list all the subjects covered in a few minutes. I've given you a few examples of their variety. As a fun exercise, I entered the titles of the 230 surveys to produce a visual of the frequency of key words. This is the result. Not surprisingly, we see the leitmotif of this morning. The overarching theme for INED and INED surveys, the family, the family in France. 
Many survey titles also refer to age, generations, aging, childhood and youth. Several words come up in connection with immigration. We can also see many spatial terms, municipality, districts, Paris. But that is probably a title effect, because the title often indicates the geographical scope of a survey. Those titles are obviously only a hint at a thematic, chronological history that would require more time. But if I had to name the most important trends from the past 25 years of surveys, I would probably highlight two. One major feature is the exploration of the margins of society, i.e. the sensitive issue of vulnerable population groups. The other is that demographic trend surveys and longitudinal studies have expanded considerably. In conclusion, I'd like to share a few general comments with you about what makes INED's surveys so special. Each survey is tailored. That's something specific and precious about INED surveys. They are craft pieces, almost like jewellery. The design and production of surveys are integrated into a research context and have a holistic dimension, which is something I think everyone values at INED. Often they are one-off surveys, but they may be a source of inspiration and contribute to methodological development. The surveys are often methodologically innovative, Stefan will talk more about that. For example, the technique form, sharing the burden, was used in the homeless surveys. The family employer survey was unusual in linking the home and the workplace. The Ageven, events at different ages sheets, were developed and used in biographical surveys. And now there is multimodal data collection. In ed surveys are often exploratory surveys on a new subject or little covered by public statistics. The examples are the end of life and identity construction surveys. Lastly, in relationship speak, what do surveys bring? bring to INED and what does INED bring to surveys? First, what do surveys bring to INED? Well, most obviously data, original quantitative and qualitative data. Data are manna for researchers, the raw material they need to answer their research questions. What surveys also bring to INED is reputation, recognition and visibility. When we hear INED mentioned on the radio, it's usually according to an INED survey. Surveys also bring opportunities for partnerships with other organizations, usually INSE, but also others like INSERM, INVS, DRIS, CNAF and polling organizations. This allows for exchanges on methods too. And what does INED bring to surveys? Specifically, what does INED bring that most other organizations cannot? I want to emphasize what makes INED so special. Firstly, there are human resources, the original combination of grades and skills at INED. The success of INED surveys depends on the high ratio of administrative officers and technicians to researchers and the productive working relationship between their complementary skills. What INED also brings to surveys, of course, are its logistical and financial resources. Even though it's rare for a major survey to be fully funded by INED, which is probably for the best anyway. INED's input may be survey design, development or a feasibility study. What INED brings to surveys, compared with statistics offices, is our research approach, our enthusiasm for innovation. One thing I can say about INED's survey output is that it's never boring. Every year there are fascinating new surveys and themes. I'm going to end on a less positive note, because there is a downside to the success of our surveys. 
There's a danger of getting carried away and wanting to develop bigger and bigger, more and more complex, but also increasingly standardized surveys, which can become unmanageable or monopolize resources. We don't always need a massive survey to produce good research, which is also worth remembering given the importance of securing funding and maintaining statistical quality. I'll now hand over to Stefan, who will talk to you about quality and complexity. Thank you. Hello, and thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. It's not easy to speak after such eminent predecessors who have already covered some of the ground I want to discuss. I'm glad I didn't bring any notes, because they would have been useless after what has already been said. I just want to look at some of the aspects of survey production. As Cécile said, the survey service at INED is quite a unique place in France. Because of the range of skills, know-how and human and technical resources. To my knowledge, there aren't many other organizations where every stage in the production of a survey, from design to dissemination, can be handled in-house. That requires substantial resources and coordination. What else is special about INED is that the themes we work on change all the time. There are almost no repeats, except at fairly long intervals. On the contrary, demand is highly varied and our research is highly specific. For example, the other speakers mentioned research themes on sensitive issues with vulnerable groups or people who are hard to reach. For example, there is a tradition at INED, which began in the 1990s, of research on homeless people. Twenty years later, that led to a joint INSEE-INED national survey of homeless people in 2012. Clearly, INSEE's previous national homeless survey from 2001 was not considered complicated enough. The 2012 joint survey added a questionnaire in 14 languages for non-French-speaking homeless people. Now, you might think it's normal to interview people in their own language, but it actually raises major logistical problems when it comes to implementation. As if that weren't complicated enough, INED also explored the margins of the national survey in 14 languages. For example, we interviewed homeless people living in small towns that had been left out of the main survey, which was limited to urban areas with a population of at least 20,000. We also interviewed people who do not use support and food services, which is the base population for the national survey. That meant going out to interview people who sleep in forests and railway stations and who do not use soup kitchens. At INED, there is a tradition of exploring the margins of surveys, of adding complexity to the existing complexity of the research themes in order to measure the quality of what is produced. Exploring the margins is something of a speciality at INED. That's my first point. Secondly, aside from the inaccessible populations like the homeless or socially disapproved issues, like abortion in other countries, we do more straightforward work, such as surveys of the general population. Other speakers have mentioned joint surveys with INSEE, such as the Families Survey, where INED benefits from INSEE's logistics to conduct household surveys using a tried and tested methodology. INSEE surveyors, trained by INED and INSEE, go into people's homes and conduct interviews using a computer-based questionnaire. It sounds straightforward, and to some extent it is, except that the general population can also be unpredictable. It is becoming increasingly difficult to survey people, and the participation rate is falling. 
That is most obvious in surveys where INED does not use INSEE's services and therefore conducts surveys by telephone, which has become increasingly complicated. To give you an example, I did not originally come from INED. I learned about producing surveys elsewhere. One of the surveys that taught me things was the ASCF Sexual Behaviour in France survey, which was produced by INED in 1991 to 1992. To my knowledge, it was the first telephone survey on such a sensitive topic as sexual behaviour. It was fiercely debated at the time. And the stumbling block was not so much the telephone survey itself, but convincing people of the legitimacy of the approach, the type of data collection, and the quality of the responses we could obtain. There have been many studies on the survey which have confirmed the validity of the approach. But if we look now at the telephone surveys that have been conducted since then, because the method convinced the public and researchers, we can see that the environment has completely changed. In the space of 20 years, the telephone, which was a very easy way to reach people and conduct reliable surveys of the general population, has become a nightmare for survey designers. The phone book no longer exists, and instead of one phone company, there are dozens of operators. There are a few big ones, but there are also local operators like Braige Telephone in Brittany, which have as few as 10,000 subscribers. If we want full coverage, we must be able to survey all of these people. Without a phone book, we use computer-generated numbers. And that raises another problem. People have more than one kind of phone. Many of us have a landline, a mobile, and an internet line. To make matters worse, various home appliances, lifts, and roller blinds are connected to phone numbers because they can be activated remotely. Let me tell you, it is not easy to get information about the sexual behavior of the owners of roller blinds by asking the roller blinds. Even though 99% of the population can be reached by telephone, even homeless people, who we might have assumed were excluded from telephone surveys, participation rates are hard to calculate because we don't know which numbers are active or not. And they have fallen to around 45 to 50%. Conducting an epidemiological or demographic survey with a 50% participation rate for technical reasons and because people are wary of surveys because of the confusion between marketing and research is problematic. So the survey service is dedicated to supporting research and researchers and crafts surveys like jewellery, as Cécile said, to meet all the requirements of the themes. But it is also confronted with really stupid problems like how do we calculate the participation rate? Or how do we know we are calling a person and not a home appliance? The technical side of surveys is becoming more and more complex. One appealing substitute for the telephone is the Internet. But the Internet underdelivers on representativity. It is tempting to run multimodal surveys, but respondents don't answer in the same way when they are alone in front of a screen or talking to a person over the phone or face to face with an interviewer. The mode of collection strongly influences the responses. No one has a satisfactory solution for standardizing data collected through different modes. The temptation is to go large-scale, based on the idea that, since it is hard to find people to survey, we should recruit the respondents once and for all, and then survey them whenever we want. In that respect, INET has joined Sciences Po on the ELLIPSE project, which is a longitudinal representative panel survey where the panelists receive a touchscreen tablet and agree to answer a 30-minute questionnaire once a month. There is a big investment in initial recruitment to make subsequent surveying easier. But all of these innovations and experiments cost money and take time, which have to be incorporated into survey planning. And we need that planning of those experiments to maintain quality standards, despite the technical complexity and difficulties of surveying people. 
I won't go on, but there are also the promises of big data and open data. Of course, we can make calculations by counting the number of likes or pokes or clicks on websites. They can be used to produce statistics, except that a demographer, a sociologist or an epidemiologist will always ask, OK, but what exactly are we counting? But that proliferation of data, which is appealing in some ways, does not meet the requirements of demographic data production or the standard of quality needed for research when we are working on people and their behavior, which is what demographers do. So the only way forward is to keep experimenting, innovating, investing in methodological research and incorporating that into survey production. Of course, I am plugging my service here, but not only. It is by maintaining that investment that we will continue to burnish INED's reputation, which, as we have already heard, is much better known than its size would suggest. We need to continue to ensure the quality of our products, to involve the respondents in our work by sending them feedback so that we are not just taking information from them but also giving something back. So we respect each other's input to ensure that surveys are recognized as a public good. Thank you.